All right. It is 4.30. Um, good afternoon. Uh, my name is Nadim Gibran. I am vice chair of the Chamber's Entrepreneurship and Small Business Council. Uh, thank you all for tuning in uh, that are here and, and virtually. Uh, this has kind of come up over the last two and a half, three months, and uh, we're so appreciative of, of our partners, the, the Chamber, KEC, and Innovate 65 Alliance. Um, so today is our first event of three events about angel investing, and it is what it is, why it matters, why the time is now, and really an overview of angel investing and how it can benefit you, the community, and the entrepreneur. Today we will hear from two panels, one, local industry experts about angel investing. Uh, the second is Knoxville residents and founders of successful startups that received angel funds and later became angel investors themselves. Um, after the second panel discussion, we will have a question and answer. If you are virtual, please go ahead and uh, put your questions in the chat and we will, we will get to those. Uh, just a quick tidbit about uh, each of our hosts. Uh, the first is KEC, led by uh, Mr. Jim Biggs, who's here today. Uh, KEC is a business accelerated dedicated to changing lives through entrepreneurship. Um, from food trucks to tech startups, KEC helps makers and innovators with classes, events, resources, and connections. Thank you, Jim uh, and KEC, for your partnership and for hosting us tonight. Uh, the Innovate 65 Alliance is a coalition that develops, supports, and promotes Knoxville as a great place for entrepreneurs to start and grow a business. Uh, founding members of this alliance uh, include Oak Ridge National Lab, the University of Tennessee Research Foundation, Foundation, UT Research Park, TVA, the City of Knoxville, Launch Tennessee, Three Roots, Veteran Ventures, PYA, KEC, uh, UT's Anderson Center, and the Knoxville Chamber. Uh, our third host is the Knoxville Chamber, uh, which is guided by its five-year strategic vision called Path to Prosperity. Uh, which is an economic prosperity organization committed to its mission of driving regional economic prosperity. Um, these three hosts uh, and a handful of others have seen firsthand the need for more capital investments, from micro lending to venture uh, and private equity uh, opportunities. As explained in the Chamber's white paper, Capital Access Redefined, Knoxville's community of angel investors are key to keeping and growing businesses here and attracting companies to our, our region. Um, the folks that are up here with me, uh, one is, is the researcher and the consultant for the white paper, and he is our moderator for this first panel, Mr. Richard DePaul. Uh, Richard is the executive in residence here at KEC and is a venture uh, advisor for MBX Capital. Richard, thank you so much for uh, all you've done and for blooming where you are planted. We are so happy you are here. Uh, it's great to get to know you and learn from you. Uh, the panel of experts, uh, the first is Mr. Eric Dobson. He's the CEO of Sheltawi Angel Network and managing partner of Sheltawi Clean Tech Fund One. Uh, Eric spent uh, the last 29 years working in government, entrepreneurship, and venture style uh, investing. Uh, he's founded three companies, advised dozens, and led investments in 25 companies. In 2012, Eric joined Angel Capital Group which merged with Sheltawi Network in 2020. He holds a bachelor degree from the University of Tennessee, where he is a lecturer of entrepreneurship in the Tickle School of Engineering. He then received a master's of science and doctorates from the University of South Carolina. Eric, appreciate you and all you've done in the angel community. Our second expert is Mr. John Morris. John is the executive vice president for the Lighthouse Fund, a Knoxville angel fund providing capital for emerging businesses. He has also founded ClearPath Ventures, which provides strategic experiences and guidance for companies ranging from seed to early stage, with an emphasis on IT and healthcare sectors. He currently serves as a transition to use manager for National Institutes for Homeland Security and has worked with technology businesses for 25 years. With degrees in electrical engineering and computer science, John has been instrumental in forming five technology commercialization ventures, one of which, Net Learning, grew from an idea to serving 500 hospitals nationwide within seven years. John, thank you again for being here. Our third and final expert is Darren Burrell. Uh, 
Darren is the founder and president of Veteran Ventures Capital. Previously, he served as COO for Tag Resources, which is a fiduciary outsourcing company with over $2 billion in assets under management. Uh, prior to retiring from the Air Force after 21 years, Darren was the resource director of the White House Communication Agency. He is a graduate of Citadel, where he got a BS in business administration and holds two master's degrees, one in cost analysis from the Air Force Institute of Technology, the other in human resources from Central Michigan University. Mr. Burrell, thank you for being here today. Richard, here you are. Thank you, Nadim. Everybody can hear me okay? All right, let's get started. Uh, I did want to mention that it's uh, kind of timely that the uh, quarterly, the Q4 2021 report, which is a collaboration between PitchBook and the National Venture Capital Association dropped, I think last week, in which uh, they revealed that north of $330 billion was allocated to uh, the venture asset class in all of 2021. And in particular, you have seed and angel deals, uh, $13 billion and um, well, 13 billion in uh, seed deals and, and nearly a little more than 2 billion in angel de in de deals. So there's a lot of activity, there's a lot of velocity. And so what we wanna do is dig into that and see how it applies here uh, in East Tennessee, in our region. So I'll get started with the questioning. Uh, first of all, um, different ways that capital gets into a business, debt, equity. Um, Eric, you wanna Give us a view on what you've seen um, in the angel uh, realm here in East Tennessee in terms of different forms of securities that get companies started. Yeah, sure. Uh, there's still a, there's still a microphone. Yeah. It's, well, first things first. You know, angel investing is it's it's a lot of fun. I you know, hope, hope everybody understands that the uh, being able to help young companies when they when they're just starting out is, is very rewarding, both you know personally and financially. So so when you talk about angel investing, it's really um, investing time and and money into young companies that can become big companies. That's 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 the whole goal. So the way we do that uh, is 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 there are a couple of different ways. One is something you you probably call a convertible note. It's actually a promissory note where we actually technically loan the company money, but it's never paid back as a traditional loan. It converts to equity in the future. So at the end of the day, you're buying stock in the company. There's also uh, an equity investment, which I just described. We give the company money, they give us shares, we help them grow, those shares appreciate and share value, and that's how we, that's how we get our, our you know, eventual exit. And there's something that's come out in the last few years called revenue sharing. So a, a revenue-based investment would be, again, something akin to a, a promissory note, except it's just paid back as a royalty. So, you know, X percent of your quarterly revenues for, you know, X number of years, Y number of years. Um, and so what that really gives um, the ability to do is, is put money into a company early when they're very, very fluid, when they're moving fast and making decisions quickly. And as time goes on, it's kind of, you'll kind of see this as more of an escalation process. You'll see a convertible, then you'll see something, maybe the second round is a, is a direct share invest, you know, investment in shares. And what that gives you is the, gives you the ability to do is provide these companies flexibility when they need it, but much more structure and oversight as they grow um, and, and mature as companies. Okay, John, Darren, anything to add? Yeah, the one thing I'll add is uh, um, the definitions are straightforward. Eric did a great job. But the, the part where he talked about in the beginning about the interest level of what angel investing brings to the table, it's really exciting because you never know um, what's going to happen with those particular companies, and they need that guidance and strength. And so, one of uh, the examples I'll I'll do is uh, is is my own company, Veteran Ventures Capital. Um, I came to a an angel investment group uh, that was headed by Eric um, just uh, about four years ago, and was basically uh, one of those people that came in and and wanted to learn a little bit more about what it is that angel investing did. So, what y'all are doing today. Um, it, it happens to everybody who wants to get involved in any type of alternative capital. They have to take those first steps. And, you know, almost uh, f four years later, there's a venture capital company that is scaling and growing veteran-owned businesses and just did our fifth investment. But Eric's on that board because he's helped every step of the way. So you just never know what what you're going to get when you, when you start to invest your time and your res uh, resources 
but it's important to see that you just uh, that there's great opportunities across uh, East Tennessee today, and you never know what's going to happen in the future because of that. Um, I would add, and certainly well done, well laid out. Um, but the thing I would add is that um, um, the investment in, into a, a, especially a startup, a very early seed stage company is a high risk endeavor. Um, and they may not know what type of vehicle to offer to an angel investor. Um, so the thing, if, if I'm an angel investor, the thing I would look for is someone else that might lead it if I don't know. So look for a lead investor, someone who's already set the terms, already defined. Is it going to be a convertible note? Is it going to be equity? Is it going to be a, a debt arrangement? Um, that's the first thing. If that doesn't exist, then I would look at the capacity of the company to pay. Now, if, if you want to be in and how long I wanted to be in that. If I, if I was in it for the long haul to get to the big exit years down the road, that's equity. If you, want, if you want to be able to get money sooner through debt, then you need to look at the company's capacity to pay. So that, that defines what kind of structure you want to have with a particular um, uh, equity deal. Let me just ask this. What, what have I heard about safes? Obviously, you've covered convertible notes and equity, and, and, and there's um, customer funding in many cases. What are safes, and, and when do they play a role? Anyone? Um, a safe is, it's, well, it came off the West Coast about, what, five, six years ago, something like that. It's called, a, it's a secure investment, so secure uh, Secure agreement for future equity. That's it. Safe. That's why it's called safe. Uh, it is. It is essentially a convertible, uh, much like what I, call, I described as a convertible note, except it's technically an equity. It looks like more like a, a, a warrant or option on the company rather than a promissory note. But in the end of the at the end of the day, what it basically says is, I give you money now. You take that money and you go buy revenue. You know, that's a, you finish your product, get into market, get revenue rolling. And when you do your next round of capital, you give me those shares at a discounted rate, usually something in the neighborhood of 20%, something like that. So it's just, it's just a means of what we call you know, paying for the, uh, the, the risk premiums for, for early stage investors, because as John said, it's a very risky investment. So you know, that, that's the, 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 the process is making sure that you are compensated adequately for taking that risk uh, and that you give the company the right you know, again, flexibility to, to move and make fast decisions while, as, as Darren very aptly pointed out, you've got to support these companies. They're, 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 it's, not, it's more akin to adopting a puppy than buying a lottery ticket. So, Thanks for that, Eric. So lots of terms, equity, debt, maybe I'm a little confused, perhaps intrigued. How do I get started uh, as an angel investor if I'm still interested? Um, um, I'll let you each answer it, but John, why don't you? I'll start, and then yeah. um, I'll let Eric fill in all the gaps. Eric's, <laughs> Eric's thought all this through. Um, so I, I, would, I would say engagement is the number one way that an angel can get involved. That may be engagement with an individual company. It may be in a network or a fund. It may be in mentoring or, you know, coaching through the KEC or, or the Anderson Center or any of the great institutions. Uh, yeah, it, ways to be, not, not just how can I give my money, but how can I give my time and resources to help that company grow. Um, through that, you'll see, um, you'll see what the company is about but you'll also see how they respond to a community, which is absolutely important to their growth. Yeah, one, the, the couple things I'll add there is, um, what is really good about the Knoxville community is there are so many avenues for you to learn how to be an effective angel investor. And what, what it starts with is what is your passion? What do you, um, what interests you? there's probably a business that needs to be started or that is already started in that area that can use your expertise and your passion. 
There are so many great groups. All of the sponsored uh, entities that they talked about uh, in the beginning, they, each one of them have their own area of, of uh, capital access and expertise. So those areas are really key. Um, again, the, the angel groups that are local here, they're generally open free. I know uh, anybody can come to, to Eric's groups, and that's how I got engaged in it uh, several years ago. Uh, and then it's just a matter of just asking the right questions and then being a part of the community at large and learning from people around you and not just trying to read it out of a book. I would say that that's somewhat helpful, but actual, you know, listening to what's going on in the community and having an opportunity to take part in that uh, is key. And, and I would do it where you like it. If you don't understand it, I mean, obviously, people will tell you to stay away from that. So that's what I believe. Uh, I, I would agree. This is a learn. This is a learned activity, uh, and you learn by doing. So I think that's that's, that's an excellent point. Um, there are some ways you can get involved if you're thinking about becoming an angel. You there are. We have obviously the the KEC here. The Knoxville Entrepreneurship Center has an accelerator program. We have the Technology of the Future TechStars program, the accelerator program opening up in I guess February, February. Uh, and, and there are great mentoring options. If you've got experience you wish to share with, with, with startup companies and, 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 and exciting entrepreneurs, it's a great way to get involved. Obviously, there are uh, it's Veteran Ventures, there's Lighthouse Fund, there's Shelter We Angel Network. So there are, there are clearly avenues to get involved and learn from other like-minded investors. And of course, the third option is investing directly in companies. Now, I've laid that out in the, the order of both risk and time commitment, <laughs> both uh, in escalating fashion. So I, I would say, you know, if, if you don't know anything about angel investing, come and participate in some of these meetings, get engaged, see if it's something you really want to do. And if you do, there's some great options. And you can choose at that point whether or not you want to be, you know, a mentor or you want to actually be an angel investor. I have a question just came to mind, and, and I'm curious, how do I know if I have enough money to be an angel investor? How should I be thinking about you know, all the priorities for um, you know, my earnings and, and my savings and, and fitting uh, angel investing into that, into that mix? Yeah, so really what you're, what you're um, you, you've asked a pretty uh, fascinating question because there's some regulatory requirements as well as some, you know, financial planning uh, opportunities too. So, you know, f for uh, for most offerings that we're looking at today, you're looking at being an accredited investor, and there's some specific guidelines. Most of our offerings, I think, are 506 B. Um, <clears throat> so, um, Eric's done a little bit more research on the crowdfunding side, so I'm going to leave that up to him. But it, as far as that goes, there is a requirement that, uh, per the SEC on different levels of income that are um, that are recommended, you know, different amounts, whether you're married or whether you're single, what your net worth is, all these things that come into play. And that's really part of getting engaged in one of these community areas that better defines that. Uh, and if you're an accredited investor, you have lots of different options, even if you don't, that, that's, the, that's the regulatory piece. And then there's also the, you know, the asset allocation of a, of a properly diversified portfolio, which would be, you know, a portion of your um, net worth being put into alternative capital as a diversification play. But that's a little bit more on the financial planning side. So I'll let Eric talk a little bit more about the crowdfunding. Well, and I would also say, you're absolutely right, the asset allocation, this is not a retirement plan okay this is this is not something you do with your with your core and you know retirement plan savings this is something you do with that five to ten percent at the top of your portfolio which is the high risk investments it's you know you either you know you could if, if you lose it you'll cry in your beer but you'll get over it but if you win you you win you win big and that's kind of the model that's that's developed over time so um if, if you look at um sort of you know the Regulatory is very clear, you know, and that's a it's a million in net worth, or I think two hundred thousand and two hundred thousand for individual if, if you're filing individually, or three hundred thousand filing filing jointly. So that's you know, once upon a time, it's it's very you know, well. I, I won't go into history. I'll save that for later. That's a, it's a very interesting discussion how all that came to be. But the crowdfunding piece, the good news is that no matter what you make now, you may participate in private equity. 
uh, as of 2012, and then I think the rules are finally worked out in 2015, we now have crowdfunding, not just for accredited investors, but for uh, anyone that w wishes to participate. And there are limits on how much you can. I think it's 10% of your annual income. I think that's the, I think that's the rule. So the good news is, I think as, as Darren made the, made the point, there are options for anyone that wants to get involved. It just depends on whether or not you fall in, which, which category you fall into, accredited or non-accredited investor. Um, the the risk profile that 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 you take on in angel investing is is w what needs to be considered. These SEC rules are there to protect the investor, right? So, and they're also there to protect the company. So you can invest in a company without being an accredited investor, but the onus then is on the company to make sure that they're meeting all of the either state or federal rules for investing. And, and there are some limits on the number, the limits on the amount that's raised, but the company has to do that. So most companies are gonna want to say, no, we're waiting on all in accredited investors. Okay, so just to keep that in mind, that if you're not accredited and you want to invest in a company, you're putting the onus on the company to make sure they, they do everything the right way. So that's, that's important to know. The other thing, uh, going back to risk about angel investment, um, I made the statement earlier that uh, investing in seed companies is, is a risky venture. But my experience has been that risk is directly proportional to reward. So the more risk you take, the more reward you get, the less risk you take, the less reward you get, okay? So you have to have an appetite for it, you have to have a passion and interest, and you should not invest in something based on whether you're accredited or not necessarily, but you need to be passionate about what you're doing in investing, not just, hey, I've got money I wanna to give to somebody. I might add that um, the, the SEC is looking at these accredited investor rules and considering changes that might allow you to become an accredited investor without meeting the income test and the asset test, such as do you already work at an investment firm and, and conduct investment activity either as a principal or a junior person, or could you take... So there you go. Um, and so, um, you know, and then a test you could potentially take to also meet those rules. So you, I, think, I think the key is that the, 30, the 33, the 34 Securities Acts, and the 1940 Company Act, which covers more of the private uh, investment activity, are there to protect the public, right? Uh, the 33 Act, in, fa in fact, is more about essentially being fair and balanced in, in what you tell the public, don't lie. Uh, the 34 Act established the Securities Exchange Commission, and then the 40 Act is, is, is consider some of the things we're talking about here. So that's the overarching uh, goal. But it's good to see you know, the rules being relaxed and letting more people participate in, in these, in these um, private transactions. You know, Richard, just uh, again, one, one more uh, foot stomp on, on uh, hearing all those things may make some of the folks out here that are just hearing about angel investing for the first time saying, Ugh, that's a lot of regulations, that's a lot of problems, I don't want any part in it. I would encourage you not to take that route that's why you have people that do this for a living that have these forums and have these um these groups that that are there for to answer those types of questions to help traverse some of those regulatory issues and and so you know we've quoted a lot of different regulatory guidance but don't let that deter anyone who has a desire and a passion to help out young and entrepreneurs that are looking to start businesses grow with them and then make a return in the process. Those things can are, are very core to what we talk about, and then you can see the risk associated with each one of those in that confined group of experts that uh, that do this for a living. So I would I would highly encourage people to continue to learn more and not be scared off by uh, a bunch of people up here spouting uh, regulatory guidelines, <laughs> myself sure, included. Sure. <laughs> Just to follow up on Darren's thought, which was, I thought that was quite apt. Um, one of the things that, that you'll learn in this process is how to actually 
analyze, you know, there's no there's no PE ratios in private equity. I mean, there's, there's usually some of these companies don't have any operating history. That's why they don't. That's why banks banks won't typically touch them. But at the end of the day, there's some very it's a very rational or you know. Uh, industry about how we look at companies, how we analyze them, how we get to know them. And one of the the ironic things is, of course, we're the ultimate inside traders. That's the the concept is when you invest in a company like this, you literally get deeply into their business model, into their company structure, and you understand the risks at a completely different level than I, I than certainly anyone in the private and the public market's going to ever hope to imagine. So uh, that that's part of the fun, but it's also it's a completely different approach than most people would take to uh, investing, especially in the public markets. Thanks, Eric. So if I'm sitting there and and I think I'm eligible to become an angel investor, how do I access deal flow? How do I generate deal flow? How do I build a pipeline of deals? Anyone, um, John? So I, I would say all the things we've mentioned, uh, the engagement of uh, local groups uh, to find companies, um, get engaged with other investors. Um, the majority of investors in this country have networks of people where they hear of deals. You'll, you'll see um, venture um, uh, con conferences for example, where companies come and pitch their, um, their, their wares and, and their company. But my experience has been that usually that's for the venture capital to come and network together to understand what that deal's all about or what their deal's all about and to talk about which ones they like. Um, angel investing is no different. Angel investing, if, if you get to know other angel investors you'll learn about deals and deal flow that maybe they're investing in or maybe um, that you might be interested in and you can then uh, purport to them. So I, I, I think that's engagement still is the number one way to, uh, to find deal flow. Yeah, just to piggyback on that too, um, a perfect example of that is I'm actually going to one of those venture conferences next week to partake in about 100 companies that are going to be uh, presenting a, a small portion of which are veteran owned, which is where we focus. And that's it. The, just like any other business endeavor, it's about relationships, it's about cultivating that network of people that are like minded and then have access to certain deal flow. We get a lot uh, organically. We partner with locals, like when Eric and his team gets a veteran owned business, they come to us for helping a little bit of subject matter expertise validation, and the same goes back and forth. If we get a medical group, I know where to go, a medical device. And so that's about the relationships that we have, both locally and then regionally and then ultimately nationally, uh, to, to really help find the right deals uh, so that when someone comes in and wants to be an investor, they've got a group of people that have been doing it for a while and, and actually have that ability to, to help find that larger opportunity. Absolutely. And, you know, the, you mentioned exist, the ex existing angels groups. We actually syndicate very broadly across the southeast uh, and Midwest with other angel groups. So we share deal flow back and forth um, you, just locally. But if you look at locally, we've got obviously the KEC. We've got the up, upcoming Techstars Accelerator. You have the Innovation Crossroads Program at Oak Ridge. You've got the Anderson School of, you know, of Entrepreneurship here at UT. So there, there are companies, there are opportunities constantly floating around in this community. Uh, and so, you know, the question is, how do you, how do you latch on to that, to that stream of, of, of innovation? And, and so this is exactly through these kind of forums, uh, getting to know, as John said, getting to know other investors in the community, networking with them, and, uh, and, and quite frankly, networking with entrepreneurs. They know each other, too. So, um, you know, it's, it's not an us and them scenario. It's, a, it's sort of a best fit scenario. So uh, lots of opportunities here. Yeah, definitely don't underestimate your own network. Um, just a story um, from my background. One of my former colleagues at Morgan Stanley went off to business school and then started um, a company called Council, K-C-O-U-N-S-Y-L. Uh, which analyzed blood assays for at-risk mothers, sold that business and now started another one um, in, in, in the biotech arena. And so, you know, typically in finance, you have people kind of march through the, the, the ranks and, and, you know, maybe get to a partner level or an MD level. 
Uh, so you never know uh, what, what, what paths people are going to take. And so, um, you know, don't underestimate the, the context you already have. So let's uh, round out the questioning with um, bringing it home here to Knoxville and, and how you would uh, articulate the need and the ability of us to attract companies to the area that become eligible for, um, you know, angel or seed investing. Well, Eric Darren? started off the group um, mm -hmm. by naming all the different innovation crossroads and the accelerators at UT and KEC. We actually have one for strictly for veterans businesses as well. The Veterans in Residence program that we, we do at Veteran Ventures in concert with Bunker Labs that meets here in the KEC as well. There's a lot of di different ways that we can promote the, uh, the entrepreneurs to start businesses here and which again the KEC does a great job of the the made for Knoxville group that's just started uh, really pushing out success stories here to attract more businesses here which then attracts more capital and I think that that's really the key is is as long as we are delivering quality innovative companies the capital is going to come and and uh, and really help those companies scale and grow yeah, so it's like a chicken and egg thing. Uh, you have to have the companies for the capital, but you have to have the capital for the companies, right? Um, I think our challenge in, in the East Tennessee area for many years has been capital because capital is the stickiness that allows companies to stay. Um, if I've heard of or know of a company who has moved out of Knoxville that was started here, it typically is because of capital. They go to somewhere where they're getting in, they're 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 getting invested capital, and and that is um, maybe because that venture capital source wants them close. Um, that that has not just been Sil Silicon Valley or Boston, even though those two were pretty big. Um, it really has been wherever the capital exists, that's where they go. So. Um, it, it really behooves us as Knoxvillians, I think, to, to, to build and encourage a strong investment community, particularly in high growth, high tech startups. We, we have as much technology at our fingertips as anyone in the country, maybe more. Um, but our ability to commercialize those technologies and keep them here for income and job and wealth producing is directly related to the amount of capital we have. So, you know, I, I think not, not to say you should invest in a company because you love Knoxville, but you should invest in companies because you love Knoxville. <laughs> um, it, it really is that simple. Um, and, and, I, and I would encourage you to, to really, if you haven't looked into it, Make sure that you do because it is a, it 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 it's fun to watch. Um, sometimes it can be heartbreaking, but boy, if you have a a win, it is the best feeling in the world. Yeah, the word everyone uses, at least, is, is ecosystem. You want you want an ecosystem where ventures form, they grow, they create they create residual wealth, and that 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 process just accelerates. Uh, and I think you know Knoxville is at an interesting crossing point, cross point right now, cross maybe a crossroads. But um, we've got you know historically we've been we you can see the you know in the I guess in the in the in the Jim Collins world the flywheel spinning. You've been growing and suddenly now we have the Tech Startup Accelerator coming on top of all these other great programs that are already here, and we'll be recruiting companies from all over the country, maybe even the world, uh, will be coming here for you know a three three or so month period where they learn to learn to hone their craft and, and create their business plans and go seek capital so the good news is um you know it's, sometimes it's easier to form your own companies in your ecosystem if you have intellectual property like oak ridge but in this case we're, we're going to be having a lot of companies coming in now if we want them to stay we have to have capital because that's that as john said that's the stickiness because when a company forms they either bootstrap in which case they don't care about capital or they find capital move to capital or die on the vine it's just it's that simple um, there's, there's a critical resource for startup companies so um, and I, I would I will say that after 
20 years of 20, yeah, 20, 20 years of being in this industry, either raising capital as an entrepreneur or investing capital as, a, as an investor, I will tell you that you solve the chicken and egg problem by creating a vibrant investor class. Entrepreneurs are, I won't say ubiquitous, but, but they're, they're, they're widespread. Intellectual property uh, is, 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 uh, is widespread here. We have plenty of, plenty of opportunity. The question is, do we have enough investors to capitalize on it and, and really take advantage of it to, to sort of top off that ecosystem concept? So I think we have five more minutes um, here. And so a question comes to mind, Eric, as you're saying this. As a community, um, is, there, is there a magic number of active angels that, that we would need in order to reliably fill syndicates for, uh, for early stage companies? How should, we, how should the community be thinking about the growth of the number of angels that are active in order for those companies you know, not to get plucked away, for instance, um, uh, by downstream investors? Yeah, that's a great question. Um, you know, there, there's also two kinds of investors. There are those that sort of sit in the shadows and maybe pass the hat occasionally in their own little private groups. But, you know, to, to create an ecosystem, you need angels that are willing to self-select and self-identify in the community and say, hey, I'm, I'm here, I'm an investor, and I'm, I'm happy to look at your deal. Um, and I, maybe I can go bring some of these folks from the sidelines in as well. So you need about, for, for a community this size, you need about 100 of those self-identified, self, you know, self-acknowledged uh, self, uh, um, uh, investors in the community to make active. that work, actively we investing have. on a regular basis. And, and one of the things I probably should have mentioned earlier, when you, when you think about angel investing, um, you probably the best thing to do is figure out what your what your budget is for a year. If you've got ten thousand to invest, if you've got a hundred thousand to invest, you should invest that over at least ten companies if you can. Okay, so this isn't an all all eggs in one basket kind of model. It's spread you know spread spread the wealth, work with these companies and help them. Like so a deal a month or something on that. Order. Something along those lines if you can do that. Yeah. Well, John, Darren, Eric, thank you so much for helping us understand what angel investing is. And now I'll turn it over to Nadim to introduce the next panel. Thanks, guys. John, you'll stay up here with, with me. Um, you know, I was thinking about, John was saying how you keep them here. And one thing that's interesting is the companies that need angel funds now in 10 years may need a whole other series. And we've had several companies that have done that. And so... Uh, it's really, really an honor to be here. Um, uh, Trisha and Bill, will you guys come up uh, as well? Um, so this next set of panelists uh, are for Knoxville residents and founders of successful startups uh, that are, you know, originally received angel funds and now have become angel investors themselves. And Mr. John Morris will be moderating. Um, our first panelist is uh, new to town. Her and her husband just moved here, uh, Trisha Martinez. Uh, she's the managing director of Techstars, which is Industries of the Future Accelerator, which is right here in Knoxville. Um, she's an experienced serial entrepreneur, investor, and activist who is passionate about driving large-scale impact through technology and innovation. Trisha was named the top 20 founders of color by Conscious Company Magazine and Hispanic Entrepreneur of the Year by USHCC a top 100 fintech leader. Uh, prior to Techstars, Trissa served as the White House Presidential Innovation Fellow at the Department of Energy. An alumna of L uh, London Barclays Accelerator powered Techstars, she developed blockchain-enabled financial services platform, Walla? Walla. 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 <laughs> um, uh, thank you, Trisha, and welcome to Knoxville. Uh, happy to meet your husband, too, Lebanese. Welcome, Habibi. Um, our second uh, panelist is Mr. Uh, Bill Mox. Bill is a serial entrepreneur and CEO of No One Therapeutics. Uh, he has founded multiple companies across diverse product lines, successfully building uh, and leading engineering, sales, marketing, finance, and operations teams uh, from concept to scale. Four of these companies have had successful exits, including GridSmart Technologies, his other exits included mergers of Flextronics and Sirit Technologies. His companies have raised over $150 million in risk capital. A graduate of Detroit uh, Mercy 
Bill is most proud of having created over 100 or 1,000 full-time jobs. 1,000 full-time jobs. That's a fantastic. Thank you, Bill. Um, our third panelist uh, was not able to be here. Uh, he will be at our next one, and that is Mr. Chad Seaver. Uh, he's the CEO of Arcus Bioscience. Um, John, thank you. Sure. So before we start talking about investing or angel investing, I think it's really important to, for people to understand the businesses that you worked in. So why don't we start there? Why don't, why don't you tell us a little about, uh, Tricia, about Walla, and then Bill will talk about yours in a second. Do you want the long or the short story? <laughs> oh, that depends on how long the long story is. <laughs> I'll, I'll, I'll give, I'll give a, a quick overview. So um, Walla is a, a blockchain-enabled financial services platform. So we were addressing the massive global problem around unbanked and underbanked consumers. So half of the global population cannot access financial services. The financial system was not designed for the vast majority of consumers around the world. So we built um, a, initially a digital bank where we were working in partnership with large banks across sub-Saharan Africa to serve as a front end mobile uh, platform to acquire customers, get them into the financial system so they could access checking accounts, uh, pay bills, uh, access loans, micro insurance. Um, after about a few years of working in partnership with large banks across South Africa, Uganda, um, Zimbabwe, and banging our head against the wall because we couldn't launch a product for regulatory reasons and for many reasons that fintechs understand, banks are hard to work with, we ended up deciding to do it ourselves, go crypto. Uh, if you can build uh, utilizing blockchain and totally mitigate and work around banks and the regulatory system because the regulators don't really know how to regulate crypto yet. Um, we had over a million customers, people who had signed up and were waiting to use a platform, a, a community we created uh, over the course of you know six years. Uh, so we were learning with them their, their problems, their needs, um, we actually were based in South Africa. We ended up building there for about five years and launched a product in a few markets. Um, and so what we ended up designing was we, we issued a new cryptocurrency um, and consumers came to us and basically used our platform to move money across borders instantly at no cost. They were paying for their electricity in their homes. They were buying data for their mobile phones, um, paying for their kids' school fees. And we had a big vision of building the financial platform for emerging markets, something that um, was designed for the consumers and by consumers who had essentially been left out of the financial system. Um, we built this really at like the very beginning stages of when you all might remember the ICO market, crypto got really hot, people were getting excited about by it but there were not a lot of active crypto venture capital funds, and there were not a lot of active crypto angels who truly understood that marketplace, especially when we're talking about emerging markets like Sub-Saharan Africa. So over the course of seven years or so of building our company, I would say fundraising was hands down the most difficult thing. Um, we had a number of red flags against us, Africa-focused, focusing on consumers and poverty and focusing on cryptocurrency. Um, all things that a lot of, especially American VCs, are not that attracted to, still to this day. Um, and so despite there being an, a really great, incredible growth opportunity, we did struggle with fundraising. I, as, as the CEO, your job is to fundraise, to, to find resources, to build that team, and to continue to scale that business. Um, and, you know, looking back, I just remember that I relied heavily on angel investors uh, because VCs did not have that risk appetite around the crypto market at that point. And so developed close relationships with a lot of angel investors who we're still close uh, in, in friendship with today. Um, and, you know, over the course of seven years of building, we ended up, like I said, going live, launching in multiple markets. We got to a point, a growth inflection point where we needed funding and it was what was called the crypto winter. Um, we had an acquirer come to us saying they wanted to, to buy um, the, the technology and, and scale what we had built across um, Africa and Asian markets. And so we moved forward with that and the acquisition did not end up happening. Mm. So it's one of those things as a entrepreneur where, you know, you 
struggle with some fundraising, you see a potential opportunity, we want that opportunity, ended up shutting down operations for that to happen, and then the sale did not actually happen. So um, it is a, a failure exit, I will call it. Um, it's a, we could go back and build it today and it probably would be much more successful because a lot of investors now have that risk appetite. And it's frustrating for me because it's still such a massive, massive problem. And the approach is definitely um, the right approach in terms of a decentralized financial system. Um, and so we ended up you know, shutting down operations. We have the IP. It is a never ending wall of story because we're still engaging another party who is interested in the IP. And so I, we really just want it to end. <laughs> so we can you know, say it was a, a failure or a win. We still don't really know. Um, but in any case, we said, let's move forward and continue building other things. So mm -hmm. that's what led us to Knoxville, um, where I'm now, you know, the managing director for Techstars. And my husband, Samer, is a, a GP of a fintech venture fund, investing a lot of great crypto and fintech companies and running a fintech accelerator as well. Great. great. So, so you learned through this failure right yes. oh oh my gosh yes <laughs> i mean i can't even tell you that. <clears throat> i feel like during the course of the seven years of building we I, failed constantly like it was just every day a, a, it, a massive learning so so that, that that's a really important thing maybe, maybe we'll come back to that in just a minute but but failure is uh something that ecosystems as eric was talking about really should be adopting mm -hmm. um because the learning and everything that goes goes into no matter what happens with the company is is valuable to that next thing to teaching people in an accelerator like you'll be doing um that's really that's really critical now i know um let's let's go on to bill i know bill has never failed in his life um so <laughs> talk to my wife <laughs> so bill bill tell us a little bit about grid smart first off i love that concept you know, one of the things that we did with investors is, is we always sought investors who wanted a multiple bottom line, a bottom line that took care of employees, a bottom line that can take care of the community and make a difference and give a great return to investors. And that's exactly what you all are trying to do. So just kudos. I, I, I got to express my admiration. Um, Gridsmart. So Gridsmart was a vision based traffic technology company. It was built here in Knoxville. Um, you know, I'm a big believer in something blooming where it was planted. Uh, so, I, yeah, I think right up there in Maker City, some of the things we did with Gritsmart, right, is we changed an industry. We were 20 points, not 20 percent, but 20 points better on margin than anybody in the world. And we did it because we built stuff right here in Knoxville. Mm -hmm. and, and it was a big deal, right? We ran into a lot of resistance. We had the flexibility at the beginning because my co-founder, Vic Sherrill, and myself, Self, we angel funded ourselves, but as investors came in, oh, you got to move production here, you got to move production there. That ability to establish ourselves through angel investing, that's what gave us the core. It wasn't just the proof of concept, but it was letting us establish our identity and frankly proving that we could build a product in Knoxville better than anybody else in the industry could anywhere in the world. So it is the maker city. It does happen. So kudos to everybody at KEC for that. Um, and then now, of course, Snell One, another, uh, I guess, petal in that blooming where you were planted. Um, I'm honored to be part of it. The founder is Cymbeline Coulet. She developed the technology at Oak Ridge National Lab. We use a naturally occurring human protein that actually controls inflammation in soft tissue and in bone. And it has the ability to regenerate tissue and prolong life. It heals naturally without chemicals. She was incredibly brave. She left the lab uh, without a parachute and I was blessed to join her. Today we're actually working on COVID technology. We have uh, National Science Foundation grants and multiple millions of dollars we've been able to raise all in angel investing because drug development is a long path and you got to get started somewhere. Yeah. Maker City. Yeah. <laughs> So, so um, uh, that regenerating tissue issue, that issue, um, I saw that Trek, that Star Trek episode <laughs> um, where that where that happens. We're doing that here uh, in Knoxville. Um, just just so everybody knows, tell them what GridSmart was. What what did GridSmart sell? 
So what GridSmart was, was a camera, it still is, uh, still have a huge presence down in Heron Valley. It's a camera that sees 360 degrees, and basically anything that comes into that view, it builds three-dimensional models and it starts tracking. So what it does is it gets you through the traffic intersection more efficiently. At the same time, it gathers data that lets traffic departments and people make smart decisions. So our big deal at GridSmart was we wanted to improve a billion lives because if you spend 20 minutes less sitting at an intersection, you pollute the planet less, you put less pain and, and, and torture on that blacktop, and you know there's a, there's there's a mom or dad who gets home and sees their kids 20 minutes earlier, and we actually have seen it work right here in Knoxville. We got to see the benefits of that, um, all up and down through Sevierville. Great people there, and some of the things we got to see happen in our hometown. But mm -hmm. Gritsmar ultimately ended up in 49 states and 22 countries. Mm -hmm. Um, both Nell One and GridSmart had roots in technology from the lab, correct? Absolutely, particularly Nell One. Yeah. Yes, mm -hmm. yeah, we, we partnered yeah. with the lab with GridSmart. Yeah. Mm -hmm. um, so, so let's talk a little bit about the the role of angel investing in your businesses. Um, so, how how did you view the role of angel investing? When did you when did you engage with angels? Um, was that a difficult process? Uh, just talk about how that transpired, Tricia. Um, so I think immediately with the, the the development of the idea, you know, angels was always the top priority. So we built the company out of a large incubator, the biggest in the country, called 1871 in Chicago. So that was this physical ecosystem, right? And, and this is something I've spoken with a lot of people about, that Knoxville, there's a need in East Tennessee to build a physical location where startups, angels, VCs, industry, everyone can co-locate together, innovate, and see these great things happening. So in this incubator, we were able to build up an investor uh, network through events. We participated in accelerators. We went through the Techstars program in London with Barclays Bank, where the entire you know focus of the program is to introduce you to key people that can change your business, which is what we will be doing here with Industries of the Future. But that's where we met tons and tons of angel investors. London is the fintech capital of the world, so it was important for us to go where that ecosystem was. But, um, you know, like I said, we, you know, angel investors, we're, we're still friends with them. And I, I had a mix of angel investors, people who were successful serial entrepreneurs. Our, our Two of our biggest angels were the founders of Grubhub, which you order food off of, and the founder of Open Table, which where you make reservations with. They were both passionate, ironically, about sub-Saharan Africa and the financial ecosystem. So they connected with me when I pitched, and they just it resonated with them, and they wanted to be a, a part of it. I even had other angel investors that I found on LinkedIn. I would cold call people every day asking, because based on what I saw on their, on their LinkedIn, if they would have a conversation with me, if I could pitch them, and if I could ask them for money. And we found a lot of people that way. So um, you know, you don't have to be a part of a community to be an angel investor, because hungry entrepreneurs who will hustle will find you. Uh, but you have, there are advantages of being in an ecosystem because it's less work for you. But 100%, the angel investors are the ones that drove our company forward because, like I said, the, the VC community was not willing to take that risk because um, they didn't have the appetite at that, that point in time. Okay. Bill, how about you? Um, what, what role did uh, angel investing have in GridSmart? Angel investing's had an important role in everything I've done, but I'm, I'm actually, your story's inspiring, so... Back in the 90s, before the internet, I think there's at least two people here who were born then. Um, but, 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 but seriously, I had a company in Ann Arbor, Michigan in the 90s, and I used to look in the real estate section. If anybody sold a house for more than a million dollars, I assumed they had some liquidity, and I reached out to them. So, I mean, right? There's, there, there was interesting ways to, to have at it, and it would have been a dream come true to have something, you know, that was organized. Um, to your point, GridSmart, because we had been successful before, not as much we did it ourselves. Now, one, it's been absolutely essential because the numbers are huge and we've had to raise millions of dollars and we wouldn't even exist today without it. Stepping back to GridSmart, and again, I mentioned this earlier, I think what Angel does for you, and I think it's huge, and it's somewhere where you can influence as an investor, is 
it lets you find your identity, right? It's great. Everybody is going to say, if they're honest, you build your concept, you build your product, you build your prototype, you have your MVP, blah, blah, blah. It's MBA terms. That's awesome. But you find your identity. If you look back, you know, Chris McAdoo's in this room somewhere. We thought we were a software company. So if you looked at GridSmart's name, we had a capital G, we had a capital S. It looked like a software logo. And we said, now we're an integrated product company. We're going to punch you in the face because we're tough. And it's all caps. And, you know, and I got to a point where I wouldn't sign a check if the invoice, they didn't have GridSmart in all caps. I'd send it back and tell them to rebill us. Angel investors let us do that. We established our identity, and it made us who we were. Mm -hmm. I'll also piggyback off of that, that I think what, what's interesting about the companies you've built with what we built with Walla, like it was essentially novel technology, something new that the market hasn't seen before. So a lot of traditional financing might not have that appetite for it. And what's interesting about what's happening here now in East Tennessee, especially with Techstars coming, especially with the assets that exist at TVA, at Oak Ridge, at UT, there are incredible scientists and technologists building breakthrough technologies in the lab. We have government who will invest and to support them with non-dilutive funding. A lot of venture funding will not. They don't understand the space, they don't have that appetite, and it's too early for them. It is our responsibility as angels and as a community to support those technologists and scientists because they are the ones that will change the world. Like Our world actually depends on some of these technologies, and that's what I've been pushing with Industries of the Future. It is so important that we help support some of these founders because they are doing breakthrough things that will stop the next pandemic, that will address the next, um, you know, the next climate battles that we are up against. So angels take huge risk, but it's so much fun because you learn so much along the way and get to be part of something truly game changing. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah. Ange angels can be, um, uh, a part, they, they can be a part of the story, not just the money that they invest, but the time and the, 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 um, mentoring and even coaching that sometimes they can give can be added value as well. Right. If you're an angel investor, your DNA isn't something that changes the world. Yeah, yep. mm -hmm. absolutely. So let's talk about investment. There may be uh, people who are considering angel investment that are watching us, um, and and their question may be: If I give you money, wh what are you going to do with it? So w in your companies, what did you use the capital for? Me lead yep. off. Sure. Yep. Um, so so again, for, for me and all cases, it was about learning, right? We moved towards that product, but with the angel capital, and I'll give you an example. I've been talking to people in Big Pharma for the last six months. Don't know that I've particularly enjoyed it, but I've learned a heck of a lot, and I've had the ability to do that because the angel capital empowered us to get to a point where I had something shiny that I could put in front of them. Same thing with GridSmart. I spent time, I went to you know traffic departments and you know, 40 of the 50 states, and I had a conversation piece and where I could ask them, not what do you want, but what's the problem you're trying to solve, and take that back to the laboratory. That, that patience isn't there in, in venture capital for that. And I will share from one of our exits, one of our stories, and this, it was at the closing dinner, very successful exit, and I actually had an investor who came up and said, boy, you guys really lucked out because you didn't really have a market when you started, but that market really came to you, didn't it? <laughs> and, and I'm pervading there. That, that's about the story. So, so I think angel capital empower, has always empowered us to figure out what we want to be when we grow up. Yeah, yeah. absolutely. I, I think it's, um, so it's dependent on the angel and also the entrepreneur. Um, and it depends on where you're at in your startup life cycle. Uh, when we first started out, I had about five angel investors say, listen, we don't want you to feel the stress of the startup life, like being rushed to just go raise from VCs or just deliver whatever. We're just going to throw some money at you so you can have this in the bank and feel comfortable to go research and build, uh, which is great because they were entrepreneurs themselves. They understood they don't want you living off of ramen and dying just to try to survive. 
Um, and then there are other points at which you are close to launch, right? You have your MVP and you're about to go live in the market and you need some, you need a bridge round. You need extra cash to hit the next six month uh, inflection point of where you can really show true data to the next round of investors to attract, attract that next round of funding. So, you know, you ask your angels to come in and throw in $500,000 to deliver on that. And here's what you're going to, um, here's the data you're going to see. And it's the angel's job to push, to ask what you're going to deliver on to to see numbers to to pull out information from the entrepreneur's head to understand how are you thinking how are you going to deliver what are you going to do with the when these risks come up uh, come up to you and what how are you going to um, navigate yeah. so it just and you know it, it depends on that relationship I think it varies by every individual mm -hmm. yeah. yeah so um, so I, both of you are now angel investors yourselves so. Tell us why you decided to do that and why anybody else should even consider the possibility. Go ahead, uh, Tricia. Yeah, I'll start. So um, my husband and I, Angel, invest in uh, companies that we're personally interested in. So we really love the fintech space since we know it well. We like crypto a lot. Um, so we're, we're looking generally for companies that can change the world and that um, where there's an untapped opportunity. Um, now... Both of us, actually, as running accelerators on our day jobs, we also in invest in early stage businesses through accelerator models. Um, and for me, it's always about impact. Who are the individuals that I believe can change the world? Um, you know, we have countless problems that we are up against. I don't care about the next social media app or anything like that. I care about the scientists and technologists that can really change the world and address some of the greatest global challenges we have. Um, <clears throat> but I think that... Um, for us, it has been in large part, we know how important and critical angel, uh, angel investors are to the success of early stage businesses. So it's our turn now to give back and to be a part of that greater ecosystem. And I think most entrepreneurs end up doing that because they recognize they could never have survived without angels. So it's this community that only grows more and more. And that's why we see Silicon Valley so successful, because the people who have exited companies go out and angel invest, and then it just replicates more and more and more, and this community gets bigger and bigger. So we, as a community, need to not only um, build more businesses and then go invest, but we need to step up as individuals and look at this as this is about building a community. I'm not going to make $100 million on my first investment. It's a high, high chance you will lose all your money, but that's okay. You're building the community, and you're making it a much better place for that investment. Thank you. Um, I, so first off, when I look for something, I was raised in Detroit, so there's a certain imprint that leaves on you. Then you come someplace like Knoxville where people are constantly telling you, especially in the early years, like, you know, John, you and I met each other 20 years ago. You can't do that in Knoxville. So, so I'm looking for an entrepreneur who just got that grit, got that battle, got that fire in the gut. And then it falls into, from, from there, is there something that I can add? And, and again, that's the thing. Sometimes I can look at a company and say, that is freaking awesome, and, and I can't add two cents to that. And sometimes I say, yeah, there, there's something I've done before. There's something I can add. So those are important things to me. And, and to your point, there's a particular investment my wife and I made. Uh, I went home. I said, I want to put this much money in this and understand this investment is probably going to be worthless in 90 days. <laughs> but we're going, to give it a, we're going to give it a swing. So and to their credit, it was six months. <laughs> But, but we understood exactly what we were doing. Right. And, and th that's, that's really important. Uh, family is an important part of angel investing, right? You, you, sh you probably shouldn't do it unilaterally. Uh, you probably should have discussion with your family and your family member about it. Um, I can tell you from personal experience that it does get easier as you go along um, because they start to see that, um, you know, my, my wife, when I first jumped into small business, actually said to me, uh, I asked her, I said, what, what's the worst that could happen when we jump into this thing? She said, uh, we'll go hungry. Um, and then I started to think, mm, probably we won't go hungry. That's not, that's probably not the worst case scenario. Um, and so we really started to realistically think about what's the risk we're taking in in doing this. And, and I think that's the same way. You should evaluate that risk 
of angel investing with the people you love and the people you care about and the people that you've made your, your, your fortune or, or um, home with and, and try to understand, um, is this right for me? Um, because believe me, it's a whole lot easier when you go and, and, and get that, that understanding from people. Um, I, I will tell you, um, thank you both for being here. Um, uh, Bill, as you said, we go back 20 years and, and uh, I'll, I'll give, uh, I'll, I'll tell you that um, Bill and, and his partner Vig are great examples of how a community and an ecosystem churn their success. Um, Bill is now with a, with, with a very promising startup. Uh, Vig has also started another very promising startup. Um, they are engaged in the area and we need more angel investors and we need more entrepreneurs that are doing that over and over and over again. Uh, so thank you all for being uh, here and participating. Uh, certainly look forward to everything you're going to do. Thank you. Yeah. So, Richard, I'll turn it over to, I think, Richard, right? Yep. Yeah. Great. I think we stay here. I think we stay here. Okay, well thank you everybody for your patience up until now. We're moving into the uh, question and answer portion of the event. I want to introduce first Nancy Neighbors. I, I don't think she's gonna come into the frame, but she's sitting right there. Director of Regional Enhancement for the Knoxville uh, Chamber and she leads uh, efforts that support entrepreneurship uh, here in the community. There were uh, some advanced questions in Eventbrite that I believe we covered in the course of the panel and so now uh, we'll see if there are any uh, questions in the chat that we can answer here um, among the panel. So if I heard you correctly, the question was, how as entrepreneurs did we vet the vang angels? And, and, and I think that that is actually an outstanding question. And one of the things, quite honestly, that f for me personally, as I've jumped into this, is chemistry, right? It, it, it's like a speed dating. I, th I think about the idea that this person is going to be part of my life on a very extensive basis for the foreseeable future. And is this somebody who I want to build a life with? I want to build a business with. I want to drive things because they're going to be a big part of it. So, so chemistry is overwhelming. And, and I will say, and um, Vic Cheryl, who I've done several companies with, we have turned down investors in the past because the feeling was just, that's just not a good fit. I think that's a great question because so many startups, um, and I experience this more and more now by looking at the cap tables of some companies, that so many startups who don't have uh, the resources available to them early on and understand how to vet the right investors can end up taking horrible, horrible deals from people, giving up so much of their company for a very small amount of money. Um, and so it's your job as an entrepreneur to educate yourself try to access all the resources you can, understand how to manage your cap table, what a convertible note is, what a safe is, what you know an equity round is, uh, talk to accelerator programs. You know, Techstars, for example, we help uh, entrepreneurs every day, even if you're not in our program. There are so many resources available out there. KEC does these things. Um, so you need to make sure that before you take any funding that you have the system set up properly because you can create more headache for yourself down the road legally, which will cost a lot more money. But I would say 100% it is a relationship. The, when you meet an angel investor, you are vetting them just as they are vetting you. You do not... A, the wrong angel investor could be a virus to your company. I have seen instances where you know you give up board seats and they make bad decisions. So it is your company. 
you make the shots and call the shots. So do your research and due diligence and don't take money from ever, anyone because dumb money is a real thing. Well, I will tell you that going back to the, the wrong investor, um, I, I had I was in a business uh, several years ago where I had uh, I was looking for angel investment. I had the opportunity to take the Hawaii Angels, some a group of angels in Hawaii, and and take investment from that group, or from two investors in Southern California. Um, I wrongly thought at the time that the two investors were better because they were fewer. But I learned after the fact that they were not smart money. And it, it, caused, it caused a lot of, of, of issues in, in the company. So I think that fit that they both talked about is absolutely critical. Um, make sure you're comfortable with that person. Um, Think of it like dating and marriage. Um, you're gonna be joined at the hip for some time with this person, and you want to have a good relationship there. So, you know, my my mistake that I made it it goes back to that relationship and knowing that, uh, and and what that's going to be after the fact. Did, I, know, I heard you moan, Eric. Yeah. <laughs> Lord, I could go on for hours. Uh, I will say, you know, from the investor side, well, I was an entrepreneur for about a decade now. I've been an investor for about a decade. So I've made just about every mistake you can make on both sides of the ball. So um, I will say as, a, as, a, as an entrepreneur, it was taking the wrong money from the wrong people. There's no doubt. That was, that was a fast path to failure. Um, and I would say as an investor, uh, investing purely based on the charisma of an, of an entrepreneur. Uh, you've got to love the entrepreneur, but you've got to love the deal as well. They've got to have a great company foundation. They've got to have the right ethics. They've got to have uh, so many things that, that make make a company successful. Because understand that you know the deck is stacked against every entrepreneur from the start. Uh, and and I, I always liken it to a, a team in the operating room trying to save a patient before it expires. Uh, they've got to have that grit. They've got to have the passion. They've got to have all those things. But just investing purely on charisma, which I did once, and it was to my extreme detriment. Um, so, oh, sorry. Like the butter as well. Yeah, <laughs> I'll I'll say this that uh, what we've been talking about here in in startups in uh, starting um, to build something and taking in investors. What what a lot of people don't realize is uh, investors that start funds are doing the exact same thing. We are pitching our business, our fund, and trying to take in investors in us too, just to turn around and take that and put it in other businesses. So uh, with that being said in mind, I got two, two quick examples. The failure or the mistake that I made was to start a fund in the midst of a pandemic. Um, I would not advise that uh, if you're a first time funder. Not a whole lot of control over that, but it was uh, very much a relationship business as we've talked about and not being able to get in front of people and, and, uh, and talk about your value add, uh, that, that delayed us almost by a full year. But I will say that during the co course of that time, I also came in contact with what I believe to be um, a partner that was, was bringing in significant sums of money, uh, you know, several million dollars. And over the course of time, we talked about how we were going to work together and we started down that path. And that's where I found out that this individual um, was not uh, going to be, as, as we said, uh, you know, wasn't going to be a good marriage. Okay. And so I ended up having to um, sever that relationship at a time where the optics of raising a fund was already challenging enough as an emerging manager in a, in a pandemic environment. And I, I left several million dollars on the table because I just said long term, Okay, we're 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 in a in a tough spot, but long term, I just can't see how this is going to help 
benefit the companies that we are investing in and the fund that we are building up. And so I ended up having to say no to that uh, uh, individual simply because of the reasons that we've talked about here. So uh, lots of other um, uh, mistakes, but I'll, I'll, we don't have enough time for all that. That's always a challenge, to say the least, because often we don't have enough entrepreneurs of, of, of color or anything else, and so it, it sometimes are hard to find. Um, I will say that investment needs to be blind to, to race, to color, to gender. It needs to be based on your, 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 your ability to run a company. And so we've always tried at every turn to make sure that we are we are being as blind to that as possible i will say that we have several female you know ceos in our company uh, and sorry in our portfolio i think we're about 14 percent of our investments have been in female-led companies uh, which is about five points above the average so not not bad uh, but we can do better and we hope to do so because it's insanely important um, you know, I think one of the biggest hurdles that I had, one as an entrepreneur, being a, a Latina, I was always the only woman and the only Mexican person in the room in the finance world, in the tech world, and then being now on in, in the investor side. And it's frustrating. We need more diversity in the space because when you have diversity, you get better ideas, you get more change. And, you know, something I recognize that with my t running my Techstars program, for example, you know, diversity is, is key. I want to find the best female entrepreneurs, the best black and brown founders, the best founders in general. And anyone, any, a great entrepreneur can come from anywhere in the world and look like anyone. But for some reason, my program ended up, you know, we will be announcing our, our, our top 10 companies in the coming weeks. And my class is 100% diverse. Um, considered underrepresented and that wasn't even an intentional and it's in large part because I think diversity attracts diversity when you have someone who no offense guys is not you know the the only white guy in the room uh, not you Richard um, <laughs> we you get me um, it attracts other entrepreneurs who maybe would not otherwise go access that resource. And I think it's so important that in the, in whether it's angel investors, VCs, asset managers, like we need more diversity because not because it's the right thing to do, because we will drive so much more innovation and change in this world when we have that. So that's always top of mind to me. I think it's such a complex area. I don't know what the answer is and I don't know how we drive more diversity or investment in underrepresented founders, but it's something we really, really need to focus on and address. So thank you for that question. So let me uh, let me say two things. I think we have a few minutes here. Um, this issue of diversity and, and, and perhaps inequitable distribution or allocation of capital among um, underserved, underrepresented groups. One of the things I learned in working with the chamber to write what was uh, called capital uh, access redefined, you can see it uh, on the website, is that you know it starts pretty early, in my view. You can go back to childhood intervention efforts at the ages of three, four, and five, and then in grade schools where you can introduce the path of entrepreneurship to a young, a young kid who may not get that message from home. I know I was raised by a registered nurse. My mom was not talking about uh, finance and entrepreneurship, even though I grew up in the metro area. And I think if we do those things, more of a long-term trajectory in making a difference, then that pipeline, you know, because the debate is either unconscious bias or pipeline, right? And so if it's the idea that you want to have more eligible, underserved, entrepreneurs, allocators, uh, or founders, to me, I think that starts, um, you know, from, 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 you know, single digit age of young kids and letting them know that's an, that's an avenue for them. I know for me, my path through finance came late. 
Uh, Goldman Sachs uh, was uh, you know, kind to let me in in my early 30s. A lot of the partners are making, a lot of the bankers are making partner by then. Um, and then, and so the point is, those exposures, the earlier we can have them, I think, you, I think we would see a pretty good um, change o over time. Um, and, and, and so one other thing I'd mentioned, Trish, coming back to you on this idea of the cycle of, of investment, and you mentioned that that's broken, it functions very well in places like Massachusetts, California, and New York. What was ironic to me coming here five years ago is that the DNA of Tennessee is deep. East Tennessee, Central Tennessee, and West Tennessee, some of the most important companies in the country, in the world, I should add, uh, were, were started here. You want to look at FedEx, Hospital Corporation of America, AutoZone. There are three companies in town, if I'm not mistaken, that are owned by Berkshire Hathaway. And so there, there, there's no issue with the, with the DNA of the state and the region even in, in the idea that we want to seed and build companies here. I learned the other day that I think there are 10 companies or somewhere between eight and 10 companies in Knoxville that have generated a billion or more in annual revenue. And there's five, I think, at the moment at or near and then a few that were acquired that were generating revenue at the time. The point is um, we need to think more about the downstream investors that are going to be necessary in the, in the Series A and growth rounds that are going to keep more of those companies in town. And when we are able to do that, and there are monetization events for those entrepreneurs and their employees, they're going to become the angels that invest in the cohort behind them. And this is the thing for some reason that, 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 that seems to have been disrupted uh, in this region. And, and there's, um, there's work beyond the scope of this event being done uh, to, to, to address that. One of the thought on that process, on that, uh, that line of thinking, few people even know this, but we've had about six technology companies exit in the last five or six years for between 20 and $100 million, all that were angel funded, and nobody knows about it. So one of the things we're not doing well is telling our story. Yeah. No doubt. So, well, we say it's risky and there's loss, and we, all, we talked about failure, but there's a lot of success, too. It's a lot of fun, and some people make a lot of money, entrepreneurs and investors. Okay, well, I think um, I think that's it. I'm going to turn things over to Nadim. If we could just get a quick round of applause for our panel. Here. Thank you for your patience, and uh, I'll, I'll let you take it away. Thank you. Thank you all uh, so much for being here. Each of you brings uh, a spirit of, of energy and excitement, and, and that gives all of us hope and uh, energy for me, especially, uh, and the next generation that's coming. And so I've got a lot of friends that have moved here over the last 24 months from other metro areas or other cities. And this is the kind of stuff that it's where it starts. I mean, have we ever had a panel like this uh, to learn about angel investing? No, but we are now. And so three takeaways for me is one, um, there is a responsibility. You know somebody, I'm sure, uh, that may have an interest in this, it is, your, it is your responsibility to reach out to them. You know, we have two other events coming up. Uh, please go to the Chamber website to, to find out more about those. The second thing is it can be done here. You know, Bill, gosh, I love your energy. Just Ann Arbor, Michigan, punch you in the mouth. Uh, it's, it, it, it's, it's, it's palpable how excited you are about Maker City. Uh, and then the third thing I, I would say is... Uh, the only reason it wouldn't happen is because it's an excuse. And so, you know, the, the, the quote rings true. If you want something bad enough, you'll find a way. If not, you'll find an excuse. And I do think, you know, Tricia, you, you guys and, and Techstars bringing it, 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 it puts us in a different, in a different tier. Um, we're going to be in conversations that we hadn't been in before. And it's really our responsibility as a community to step up. So my ask would be, you do have a responsibility. Um, and so take it seriously. Uh, a few housekeeping things. Um, there is another two events. Our second uh, event will be February 15th. Uh, it'll be around uh, the deeper dive, how to angel invest. And then the third will be uh, March 22nd, and that is around uh, women in, in uh, angel investing. Um, next, uh, Angel uh, Chatelli, Angel Network will, will have a, a pitch right after this. Uh, I believe virtually they can attend as well is that accurate okay different link okay um so if you do in the chat just just raise your hand and we'll send you that link 
Um, the last thing I would say is uh, thank you to all the hosts, uh, all the people who've been involved, my council, KEC, Jim, really appreciate you opening your doors. You and your team are fantastic. Uh, Innovate 65 Alliance, uh, couldn't have done it without you. And again, please uh, check on the, the website, KEC, Innovate 65, or the chamber uh, for some opportunities on the horizon that is gonna help our ecosystem realize what we think and believe uh, can happen here. So thank you so much, enjoy the evening, and that is it. Thank you.